That's what Christianity is with the gospel. It's not just believing, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Satan believes that too. Right. Um, and even that, well, he died on the cross for my sins. Okay, you believe that that actually happened. What did you do about a person? Are you saying, I want this gift, I can't do it on my own. Thank you for forgiving my sins so I can spend eternity with you. That's what salvation is. It's been a while. Uh, I've had David fill in and we had a bit of a break and I'm real excited to be back doing Iron Sharpens Iron. And today we're with Jay Siegert. Did I say your name right? Jay Siegert? You did. That's All the right. way I say Perfect. it. <laughs> and actually, uh, as we're kicking this off, wow, the cameras were setting up and we were already were in conversation and I'm like, man, that was, I just want to kind of continue that conversation a little bit and maybe that could be our starting point. Um <laughs> No pun intended. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and, and maybe that's maybe that's a good start. Is before we jump into everything, can you do a super abbreviated version of your introduction? So for, if somebody's tuning in the first time, but also point us to your resources. Sure. Uh, the short introduction. Grew up in a Christian home. Believe the Bible cover to cover. Went to a Christian college for engineering. Got a degree. Then went to a state university for physics. My professors were telling me I was wrong about everything. And I knew what I believed as a Christian, but I didn't know why. I couldn't defend the Christian worldview, so God put it in my heart to start looking into things. So we're, here we are 39 years later. I've been looking into things a lot and felt called into full-time ministry roughly 18 years ago and founded the Starting Point Project. And so here I am today. Is that brief enough? That's brief <laughs> enough. And and they could find you at Starting Point? The, the Starting Point Project. The Starting com. Point dot com. And we'll, we'll put that somewhere in the link. And um. And you, just for context, for, for, if people are unaware, but we had you come and do a whole day on Saturday, uh, talk us through a bunch of um, creation stuff and, and um, scientific evidence of scripture and reasoning for our faith. And you spoke on Sunday um, and hit, hit a very important topic on why we can trust scripture. And that is that, uh, that is one of our, that is the starting point, God's word for us, and that it is God's word. And it's not just this extreme um, expression of faith, but it's reasoned faith. And we have great reason why we can trust it. And um, it, was, it was great. And that's going to be online too for people to look at. And, and you have so many free resources online, which um, just, I, I am just impressed with, just side note, just impressed how, your heart for ministry comes through in this because your desire is to go, I, I want people to have this. And so you've made deliberate choices to put free resources out there. And I just praise God for that and just say thanks to you. And, um, and, and I throw another comp- compliment in there just to make life awkward. Cause you know, it's always awkward to receive com- compliments on camera. Um, but I'm talking with my wife and her, her comment was this is we, over the years we've experienced and interacted with lots of ministries that teach the same thing, the authority of scripture and, and how science proves these things. And, um, and her comment this morning was what she appreciated most was you are, um, you humbly engage in the topic. And um, from our limited perspective, I think you humbly engage with the skeptic and that's refreshing because I don't, it's not something that we've always seen. Sometimes we come from a place of arrogance and, and we look down and. Yeah. That's actually a learned skill because when I started 39 years ago, I was still a kind person, but I was a, what I call a fax machine, (laughs) Not, not a copier, just spewing out facts. So I'd meet a skeptic and I would just patiently wait for them to, be done saying whatever they're going to say. I'm not wasn't even really listening much, but when they're done, I started telling them everything that I just learned thinking if they knew what I just learned, they'll realize, Oh, I guess I'm wrong. Let me go to church and worship Jesus. And it just like never worked that way. And I, I didn't understand like, what's the disconnect? Well, I, you know, learned later, this is a spiritual issue. It's not an academic debate. Um, many of these people are really smart people, yeah. um, but they're spiritually blinded. And if they don't see Christ in me, nothing I say is going to matter. Um, And along the way, um, my wife has helped me too with um, one big thing is affirming people. So you're talking to a skeptic, and one of the first things you want to do is refute what they're trying to say and and win an argument where how about complimenting them for something? Like one time I I gave a talk, 
and we opened up for Q&A, and I called on this one girl, and she just started going off. She's actually swearing. And when I was younger, I probably just said, well, you know, you really shouldn't be swearing this meeting and whatever. She finished, I said, wow, you are passionate. You know, I was affirming yeah. her for, like, really caring about this. And another, another guy, he was a Satanist. And skipping some of the details, he came to one of my talks, and someone introduced me to him out in the audience, and I, I was fascinated, like, what's a Satanist doing here at this church, this conference? So I, I said hi to him, and he just started taking shots at me right away. And I said, you know what? I said, you seem like a really deep thinker. Mm. I said, I think you think more deeply than most Christians that I know, and these questions you're bringing up, those are great questions. Yeah. We had a nice conversation. He came all four weeks to this conference, and at the end he said, you need to come and tell my friends about this. It was a Satanist. It wasn't because I won an argument. It was right. just I was affirming him for who he was and the fact that he went out of his way to be there. So lots of examples like that. And uh, one other quick short story early on, uh, something happened, and it only needed to happen once. And I was speaking at uh, it was Marquette University in Milwaukee because I'm from Wisconsin, and I was invited by the InterVarsity group. So I was in there, I gave a talk, uh, largely, probably like 95% science on purpose because I knew there would be a lot of visitors and skeptics there and I didn't want them to think that I'm just quoting Bible verses the whole right. time. So the talk went fine, we did Q&A, that went fine. Afterwards, I'm in the audience casually talking to some people and there's one guy in particular I'm talking to and I didn't know who he was. He looked a little bit, little bit older than a college student, but I just didn't know, you know what his connection was. So we're talking, and we were talking about thermodynamics because I had done a presentation on thermodynamics during the talk. And we're going back and forth, and I just feel like I'm not getting through to this guy. So I finally said, you know what? Um, I have a degree in physics. I know what I'm talking about. He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I got a Ph.D. in physics, and I'm a professor here. <laughs> I just started laughing. He, he got me. And what yeah. now he was actually still wrong in his argument, yeah. but God taught me don't ever, ever, ever bring up your background as a uh, evidence that you're right. Yeah, the arguments have to stand on their own, they're never right or wrong based on someone's background. So I only had to learn that uh, humiliating lesson once. Um, but it's just things like that over 39 years. You learn more, you learn how to interact. These are human beings. They're people. Yeah. They, they have needs and thoughts and feelings. And um, so, and I, the more I know of myself, the more humbling it is that God allows me to do anything. So I've become naturally more gracious just because I don't have any other options. <laughs> right. Yeah. And God's good about that, right? Yes. He, he makes sure to keep us humble when we need it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we were talking before the camera started rolling, we were talking about where you've traveled. And, and my, my question at the time was, where where has that been most difficult for you as you're engaging with the authority of scripture and you're engaging with science and creation and um, where has it been most challenging and where we ended up with is probably here in the U.S. And could you tell me more about that? Sure. You know, occasionally on an international uh, trip, you run into people that uh, there's something called syncretism where they're growing up and they have certain beliefs and then they're introduced to Christianity and they end up, init at least initially, putting the two together. They yeah. synchronize them, syncretism. And so sometimes when you're talking to someone and they seem to be buying into and, and they're on the same page with Jesus and all that, then you realize, well, they got some other really strange beliefs too that don't go with Jesus at all. They don't even realize that the two can't fit together because they put the two together and it's a process of maturity and all that. Um, but the biggest struggle has been right here in the United States in decent churches and mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there are a lot of very very liberal churches out there that hardly believe right. the bible at all right. i'm not even talking about those i'm talking about churches that most of us would be for the most part pretty comfortable mm -hmm. in attending and sitting there most sundays what you hear is great but when you um, talk to someone on a little deeper level you find out they don't really see the bible as totally being inspired cover to cover or right. they say that but in reality, they do a lot of picking and choosing. There's a different source of authority yeah. that they use to use to then filter the Bible through that. I mean, I've heard it expressed a bunch of different ways by a bunch of different people, but but it's this idea of there really is this cultural Christianity that almost, um, the phrase I've heard most often was it kind of inoculates us against the gospel. It, does, it makes it more 
comfortable for you to fit in anywhere you go if you don't push too hard. So when you're around people that have different beliefs, you don't you don't dare tell them that they're wrong or anything because, oh, you don't want to judge them. We're not judging them. We're showing them what God's word says. But a lot of Christians are afraid to bring up scripture because then they're going to be ostracized and canceled and all these things that we're dealing with today. Yeah. So they'll try to hold on to certain aspects, maybe even privately, but not really admit that or share that with someone else for fear of them disagreeing. They don't want to get in an argument. Yeah. Um, and actually one, we don't have to flush this out right now, but let's say someone gets into a discussion about the topic of abortion. <clears throat> so the Christian is typically, you know, should be coming from a pro-life standpoint, Let's say the skeptic is pro-choice. So they're having a discussion, and at some point the Christian says, well, the, you know, the Bible does say, and all of a sudden the skeptic says, whoa, you got to leave your religion out of this. Mm. And what they mean is you got to leave the Bible out of this. Right. And way, way too many Christians say, well, okay, I suppose it's not fair for me to bring my, my religious views into this. When we do that, we're toast. We are yeah. instantly done why? Because you just gave up your only foundation, really, for this argument. And think about this. They're asking you to give up your foundation while they keep theirs. Yeah. Because you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. They believe it's not. They want you to give up your belief, but they keep theirs. How is that fair in any sense? So what you should say is, you know what? I, I do believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, and I realize you don't. Let's admit those biases and go from there. Because the pro-choice person would generally admit, if the Bible is the inspired word of God, case closed, and abortion is wrong, but they'll say, but I don't believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. At which yeah. point I would say, that's the actual issue. It's not abortion, it's not transgenderism, it's not gay marriage, it's not racism, it's not any of these things, it's that you don't view the Bible as being the inspired word of God. If they did, they would start to connect the dots and realize, okay, some of these things I guess are wrong, so that's really where we need to have the conversation yeah. because it's not our philosophy versus theirs. We're just pointing out what Scripture says about whatever issue is that they bring up. Yeah, and you you hit that really well on Sunday, just this idea of this is, or maybe it was maybe both days, but this the name of your organization, the starting point. It's like that we got to go back to the starting point. They have a starting point. We have a starting point. And I think that was, it's simple, easy to understand, but we we give in every single time, yeah. generally. We, we give in for probably two reasons. One is most Christians are not very well positioned to defend that the Bible truly is God's word rather than just like, well, it's, it's just what I believe, you know, it's just what I think. They don't really have the evidences. And then they're also, uh, they realize that there's a lot of biblical illiteracy on their end. They don't really know as much about the Bible as they should. And some of the things they do know they're afraid to admit because mm. it sounds so judgmental about this is wrong or that's wrong. And so they'd rather not have that topic come up. And so they generally spend very little time actually witnessing. They might say, well, yeah, I got a chance to witness my neighbor last weekend. Oh, really? Tell me about that. Well, he wanted me to help you know, clean out his garage. And I said, oh, I, I can't because I go to church. <laughs> oh, so, so when did you get to witness to him? I just told you. It's like, no, you told him you go to church. That's so not really qualifying yeah. as witnessing to him, but that's as far as they want to go because they can't necessarily explain exactly yeah. what it is that they believe and why. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's a big that's a big thing. That's so part of our conversation earlier, and maybe this is the good transition into that. Is I am I would love to hear. Um, the, what you alluded to on Sunday of, man, I want to write this other book because there's so many stories where God is, um, in his grace, has allowed you to have these conversations and to use this process and see people, uh, see some lives changed. And, and even in asking that, I would love to hear a story or two, but even in that process, um, what does it look like for as our people are sitting here and they hear, okay, we need to have this starting point. We need to have some understanding, um, even if it's not advanced like yours, some understanding of why we believe what we believe. How do they take that and graciously, not con with without condemnation or condensation, uh, condensation, um, but graciously move it from this potential argument, fact-based to, 
sharing the gospel? Like, what does that process look like? And sure. Yeah, I can, uh, I'll just throw out like one example of just how God has worked. Again, one of the books that I want to write, I'll probably call Stuff God Does, because there's just so many stories. And in fact, I had, you know, I share a story or two, and then someone would say, oh, you got to write a book. That's a common response people say generically. But then I right. heard another person and another person. And then I started to feel like God's telling me he wants me to share this because it's it's so encouraging to people when they hear these stories. Because when God yeah. wants to do something, he will step in and fulfill. And so as long as we're open to what that is, uh, he'll make it happen. And we yeah. don't have to twist people's arms. We just have to let people know the direction God is giving us and but just so I'll share one story. It's even kind of humorous of how what God did kind of to get the ministry going. And then I'll share a scenario of how we get into these conversations okay. the way it typically happens, which is not good, and then a much, much better way. So the, just one story out of many. So prior to me going into full-time ministry, which is just over 18 years ago, uh, at that time I had my own computer programming business and I was working out of my home and it was going really well. I had gone almost five years of having my own business, which I never had before, without making one phone call. The work just kept, kept coming in, and everyone says, that just is unheard of. That does not happen. Well, with God, it does. So he was providing for me that way. And then I felt called into full-time ministry. That's a whole story I'll skip for now, but I, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I sensed it was so clear. I would wanted it prior to that uh, for 20 years, mm. and... Um, anyway, but finally I felt like, okay, now is the time. So I had to start a nonprofit ministry, which I knew nothing about. And there's other stories with people stepping in and helping me with, you know, filling out paperwork and doing things. But the biggest thing at that time was I had financial needs. I was doing really well with my own business, but now I was going to shut that down and start a nonprofit ministry in which I'm not going to charge for what we do yeah. because I felt God saying, don't charge I was going to get out a spreadsheet. I was a spreadsheet expert and like, what would I put on there There's, <laughs> if I don't charge anything? And I counseled with three different pastors and they all said, we sense God wants you in full-time ministry, but don't ask us where the money's coming from. We have no idea. And I'm like, that's kind of what I really wanted to know. Right, that, yeah. Where's the money coming from? And they had no comments on that. So I just had to trust God. So in this transitional phase, I needed to do some computer programming to have the income come in to pay the bills and I have a wife and two kids and mortgage and utility bills and things. I needed some of that income as I'm trying to figure out how do I get a ministry going? And my biggest need was I needed to replace my car. It was getting older. And initially, you know, 18 years ago, I would have been driving a lot more in Wisconsin and maybe into Illinois and Minnesota. And I wasn't thinking about flying places and international travel at all. And I thought my car is not going to make it driving a lot more. So I need to replace it. My wife and I had no debt other than our mortgage, but we didn't have much money in the bank either. So I didn't have money to replace the car. So as I'm still trying to get work, and I'd said that my phone, uh, or I had never made a single phone call to get work, when I was called into full-time ministry, my phone stopped ringing. No more work coming in. I'm like, <laughs> this is interesting. The timing is interesting because God's calling me to full-time ministry, but I do need some work here to get this going. And so I'm praying. I'm like, God, I, I need some work. So I'm driving through the city that I was born in and I still live and live today. It's about a half an hour west of Milwaukee. It's called Waukesha. And I'm driving through there. And I'm driving past an, a business called Waukesha Engine. I've driven by it thousands of times in my life. It's in Waukesha and they make engines. That's all I know. <laughs> I didn't know anyone that had worked there. Um, but I'm driving by in my car that I need to replace. And as I'm driving, I look over at the building and I say, God, get me a project there, a programming project. And then I keep driving. <laughs> and then I start laughing. And I'm like, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah I'm going to tell God, get me a programming project there, and it's just going to happen. So I thought, that's weird. I kind of laughed it off and kept driving. A week later, my phone, which had not been ringing, rang. And it was a local consulting firm that I had done some programming for years ago. And they said, hey, we got this project that came up. It's huge. We need your help on it. It's a Waukesha Engine. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, there are thousands of companies in the area. Yeah. And it's just, I started laughing. I'm like, God, this is, you had a sense of humor. Yeah. I just feel like God's saying, watch this. And so I ended up um, scoping out the project. And I told the consulting firm, yeah, I'll, I'll take it on. And then Waukesha Engine kept wanting more and more with this project. And so I pulled in a friend to work with me. 
I kept growing. I finally said, I'm backing out. This is too much. I have no time to go into ministry now. Um, yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I turned it over to some other programmers. But in like two and a half months, I made enough money to pay to sell my car, pay cash for another used car. So God did that <clears throat> to provide the funds to replace the car in a humorous way. You didn't have to do that's it awesome. that way. And there's so many of those stories. You could say it's a coincidence. Fine, if you want to believe that. But there are so many of those stories. Right. Yeah. So that's the encouraging thing there. And then just um, a very practical piece of advice for getting into conversations. So here's a typical conversation between a Christian and a skeptic. Uh, the skeptic might say something like, evolution's a fact and the Bible's just myth. And then what the Christian does, knee-jerk reaction, you just claim the opposite. Well, no, uh, creation's true and the Bible's the inspired word of God. Then the skeptic says, prove it. Just, just give me one fact, just one fact that proves creation is true or the Bible's the inspired word of God. And then the Christians back on their heels like, ah, oh, well, I, I don't know that I can prove it, but that's what I believe. Yeah, you have your nice little mythological view of this outdated ancient religious book that's been copied so many times and distorted. But I live in the real world. We deal with science and we prove things and they walk off. And the Christian is completely humiliated, you know, embarrassed. They're thinking, I don't know that I want to share my faith anymore. They might even start doubting their faith. Am I just like fooling myself with all this Bible stuff and rejecting science? Yeah, That's a very typical scenario. And when I share that with my audiences, they relate to it. Like, yeah, Ben, they're done that. I said, let's revisit that conversation. And we're going to change, not what the skeptic says. They're going to say what they say. We're going to change how the Christian responds. And I said, it's going to be really easy because all you're going to do is ask questions. It doesn't require yeah. you to memorize facts and to win an argument. You're actually going to do something that maybe you don't do well enough, and it took me a long time to learn, is listen. Yeah. Listen to them because the skeptic will make what we call truth claims. They're claiming something's true. We need to listen for those and get clarity on that, ask follow-up questions. So we'll revisit this. They're going to make The skeptic's going to make the same claim they did before, Evolution's a fact, and the Bible's just myth. Now you just say, how do you know evolution's a fact? They just made that claim. They on their own brought that up. Yeah. You're finding out, how do you know it's a fact? Well, I mean, all scientists believe it. Okay, they just made another tooth claim. All scientists right. believe in evolution. You don't have to try to refute it. You just ask them another question. How do you know all scientists believe it? Well, the real scientists, all the real scientists believe it. How do you define a real scientist? Right, right. Well, anyone who believes in evolution, they're a real scientist. <laughs> okay, that's circular reasoning. Right. And then you can maybe let them off the hook gently and just say, well, okay, well, what is the evidence that is so convincing to these scientists that convinces them that it's, you know, it's a fact? Well, there's tons of evidence. Okay, I, I don't really need tons. Of just a few examples would be helpful to help me understand what it is that you believe. Well, there's evidence from every area of science. Like, okay, again, I don't need a lot. Just could you give me some examples? Well, there are whole books written on it. Go get a book. Okay, so you're telling me you believe evolution is true because you think there's evidence in some book somewhere. You don't really know what it is, but you, you trust that it's out there, which means you have faith that it's true, which is okay, but you can't right. tell me it's a fact then. Yeah. And then, again, you let them off the hook. You're not trying to win an argument. You're trying to better understand who they are, what they believe, where they're coming from, why they believe those things, and why they're, they think they're true. So you move to the second claim, the Bible's just myth. Why is it that you think the Bible's just myth? Well, it's just filled with errors and contradictions. Okay, Can you give me some examples? Well, there are just tons of them. Again, I, I don't really need tons. A few would be helpful for us to discuss yeah. this. Um, well, like I said, there's so many. Again, I, you know, I don't need tons, just one or two. Well, I can't, I can't think of any right now. Okay, um, can you tell me what the Bible's all about? You know, from beginning to end, it, you know, it starts with this, this happens, that goes on, and ends with this 30 second overview. Well, it's, you know, it's been a while since I looked at it. Okay, so tell me, if you can't think of any errors or contradictions, and you don't even really know what it's all about, why do you have such a strong opinion against it? Are you sure you're not just repeating something you've heard from someone else versus your own well thought out, you know, research? Yeah. And you do that graciously, not sarcastically. Right. That whole time is all you did is you listened for the claims you're making and you want to better understand them. what do you mean by that? 
when you say evolution, you could even ask them that. Well, tell me what you mean by evolution, because it means different things to different people. So you want to know what it is that they're claiming and how do they come to that conclusion and why are they confident it's true? That's all you did is ask questions. You didn't say yeah. anything about what you believe. You didn't even say they're wrong. You're not saying they're a bad person. Right. Um, so, because sometimes they'll say, well, you believe that God created, you know, Adam and even this mystical garden, you know, and, and all that. And you could say at that point, I actually haven't said anything about what I believe. You've made some pretty bold claims and I'm just trying to better understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Anyone can do that. <laughs> yeah. Questions are so genuine. Authentic questions are so powerful. Yeah. Well, Jesus used them all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, even, I, I just think of, I, I, I love that so much because that part of my foundational premise engaging with people is we need to be, um, we need to have a Holy Spirit driven curiosity. Yes. And so what does that look like? Whether it's in relationships, I'm arguing with my wife. If I have a holy driven uh, holy driven spirit, holy spirit driven curiosity. I engage differently because I'm trying to go. Okay, what? Wait, what are we arguing about? What? What's your concern here? And, and I'm not thinking about winning the argument, right? Which that directly translates to this. It's like we go into it, and and I think often there's this tension of we come with, um, all right, I got a little bit of ammunition now, so I got my fact card that I'm going to try to, but often. Th- they are doing the exact same thing on the other side is they maybe don't have a deep foundation in some of the stuff, but they just have a just enough that they're going to come with their contrasting right. thing. And, and most skeptics, pretty similar to Christians, they're human, yeah. they have some pride, and they're not looking to be wrong. Yeah. No one is ever excited, like, oh, th- like especially with our spouses, oh, thank you so much for showing me how wrong that I was. I'm just so thankful for that. No, we... We have some resistance there. So when you're talking to a skeptic, they're not going to say, I didn't know that about the Bible. Wow, let me go to church and worship Jesus with you. Right, right. No, they're going to fight it. And as I shared, I think it was in the seminar, maybe during Q&A, the very short story of when I was over in, in United Kingdom in Oxford and um, one of the other speakers at a conference was from Northern Ireland and he was an evangelist, not a scientist, but an evangelist. And he shared that story of interacting with a nuclear physicist from Northern Ireland who was an atheist and the nuclear physicist told me, I don't believe that God exists. And his response was, no, you know God exists, but you hate him. You love your sin and you fear God's wrath. And the nuclear physicist said back to him, you are the wisest man I've ever met. <laughs> and that's transparency. It's really yeah. rare, but that actually shows where a lot of skeptics are coming from. It's not about the science. They don't want God to exist because right. they don't want to be under his rule. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to have the guilt or any responsibility. So they choose to say that the Bible is wrong or that God doesn't exist or there is a God, but God would never judge them for doing this or that. And then sometimes I say, well, maybe the God you believe in wouldn't judge you for this or that. But how do you know that that's the God that exists? Yeah. And I often then ask them, if you were to die and stand before God, what makes more sense, that he will end up judging you based on whatever standard you came up with while you were here, or will he judge you on his own standard? Yeah. Every single one is admitted. Logically, it makes more sense that God will judge us on his set standard, not our own. Uh, here's another analogy I came up with. Let's say um, we're talking about the existence of God. We have three options with God. One would be there is a God, and he created everything, including us, but he has no standards. He doesn't care about anything. We can be kind to each other. We can kill each other. He doesn't care. That doesn't make sense to anyone, that God would do all of this and not even care about it at all. So no one really buys into that option. Second option is God did create everything, including us, and he does care. He has standards. He just never bothered to tell us. So we're going to die someday, stand before God, and God's going to say, I would have let you into my heaven, but what you had to do while you're on earth is you had to sit on a wooden park bench that's painted green uh, in the rain for three and a half hours in between a slinky and a statue of Beethoven. And then you would have gotten into heaven. You were so close. You had the (laughs) slinky. Yeah. But no, (laughs) we'd be like, what? I didn't know that. And he'd say, well, yeah, I know you didn't know that, but too bad. That's my standard. That makes no sense that God would have standards, hold us accountable, but not tell us what the standards are. The third and final option is God did create everything. He does carry as standards. And he shared what those standards are. That's what the Bible claims for itself. Now, I can write a book tonight making all of those claims. 
I just can't back it up with evidence. But the Bible gives us ways to back it up, that yeah. this is God's standard. He will hold us accountable. And you might want to reject it, which is fine, but realize there are consequences for actions. We all know actions have consequences. If they don't, we would get mad that you're just going to let them do that and not have any consequences. Well, what would God do? If God has no consequences for actions, then he's not a just and righteous judge. But he is. He made it fair. He told us what that is. He will hold us accountable. If you want to reject it, that's fine. You don't want God to exist, that's fine. He will not force you to spend eternity with him. He'll give you your will. You can be separated from eternity. But uh, read scripture. It's not a good thing, and you will regret it at that point. But you have a chance right now to make the decision. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm wrong in this, but you can correct me if I am. But I think the genius of what I see God doing through you in this, it is um, you are doing less to arm believers, but more to give them a confidence to be able to ask the questions. Uh, Because I I think often when we think apologetics, it's like I'm, it's ammo and I'm arming myself for, for this battle. And I feel like, my what my takeaway from your approach is you're not giving me ammo to attack the other person with you are giving me a foundation that i can be confident in that i can be i can be this bold child of god that he wants me to be True. and that i can stand strong and and in that strength and that confidence it allows me to be able to sit there and go tell me tell me more about what you're True. saying there <clears throat> confidence is important apologetics can be dangerous for two reasons. One is it makes us this fax machine trying to win an argument because you've got all your facts. You're going to blow them away and show them how wrong they are. That's not good. And secondly, it can actually stunt your growth as a Christian mm. because in a sense, I've, I've done this way too much, especially when I was younger. It's almost as if Jesus comes up to me and says, Hey, you want to hang out today? I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm too busy telling people about you and proving that the Bible is true and all that. He goes, well, maybe tomorrow I got, yeah, tomorrow's really busy. And then maybe check back next week or whatever. And my relationship with Christ wasn't, it was kind of stagnant. It was there, but stagnant because I was into learning all these facts and So it's okay to learn those things, but you want to develop your relationship with Christ because the more Christ-like you are, the more humble you are and the more people want to be around you. My goal is for the skeptic to say, I want to hate that guy, but he's nicer to me than my friends are. Yeah. You know, they need to see that we care. Uh, A a father of a good friend of mine, a staunch German who was very secular in his beliefs, didn't really ever want to talk about anything religious. Well, he was getting up there in age and his, his wife had just passed away and he wasn't going to be around much longer. So I told my friend, I said, that's it. I'm coming over to his house and just I'm going to share the gospel with him, you know, as succinctly as I can. And so I did that. It was over there. And I wanted to warm up to it. And so I told him, you know, I was sorry to hear that his wife had passed away. It had probably been a few months earlier. And and I said, you know, life life was rough. And I said, I know that you're struggling with your health. And I said, none of us are going to be here forever. And you, you know, you're dealing with that even more right now. And I said, um, I had a question for you. If you had discovered the cure for cancer, for like all cancers, you actually had, not, you just don't think you did, you actually discovered it, would you tell other people? He goes, yes, of course I would. I'm going to skip his German accent, but he said, yeah, I would. I said, I, I believe you would. I said, what, what if someone might um, doubt you? Like, oh, I don't think you have. Would you still tell him? He goes, oh, I'd still tell him, even if they doubted that I actually had it. I said, what if they would laugh at you? Like, yeah, right, you had the cure to cancer. Would you still tell them? He goes, yeah, I'd still tell them. What if they would get mad at you? Who are you to tell me you got the cure to cancer? Would you still tell them? He goes, yeah, I'd still want them to know. And I said, I believe you. You would, you would still tell them. And then I transitioned into, I believe I know what happens to people when they die. I'm very confident. And so yeah. I want to tell you what Scripture says about this, even if you doubt me, even if you laugh at me, even if you get angry at me. And at one point, to shorten up the whole story, I asked him if he knew who Stalin was. Yeah, he knew who Stalin was. And I said, you know what Stalin's last act was on this earth? He said, no. He said, he raised his fist to God in anger, Mm. and he passed away. And that's how he died, just fighting God. And I kept talking, and then I, I shared the gospel, probably as clearly as I've ever shared it in my life. 
And when I finished, she goes, okay, you're done. I told you you could do that. No, I don't, don't want to hear anymore. And I said, you know what? I thank you. You did allow me to share that. I'm not going to say anymore. If you want to hear more later, that's fine. But I will stop now. I'll just share one other thing. I said, do you know what you're doing right now when you're telling me to stop? You don't want to hear anymore. I just held, I didn't say anything. I just held my fist and he knew exactly. And, and I didn't share anymore. And uh, sadly, as far as we know, he, he passed away after that. No indication at all that he came to Christ. I have opposite stories where there was another guy, actually a relative of mine, on his deathbed, probably minutes before he passed away, he placed his trust in Christ. Um, but the point is, it's not up to us right. to make the decision for them. Um, yeah. When we don't share the gospel with people, it says one of two things. Either we don't really believe it ourselves, that's why we're not telling them, or we do believe it, we just don't care enough about them right. to want them to know. Neither of those are good good answers. Uh, one other thing just thought of really quickly, also very powerful. <clears throat> you can read scripture cover to cover, and we should. There's nothing in there saying, if we can tell people how complex DNA is, that's going to change your mind. Right. God will sovereignly use that in someone's life to kind of get their attention, make them think about things, but there's no guarantee with it. But Scripture does guarantee us when we share God's Word, Scripture itself, it will never return void. Yeah. Isaiah 55, 11, God's Word will yeah. never return void. It will always accomplish what He wants. And as I was thinking through that, I think this is how it works. When you actually share Scripture with someone, it will accomplish what God wants in one or two ways. It will either be used to convict and convert the person, which is what God desires, but right. God will not force that out right. outcome on them. Yeah. Or it will be used to condemn them. They heard the truth, but they chose to reject it. It's not up to us to make their decision. Yeah. It's up to us to present the truth and give them the opportunity to make a decision. So the Holy Spirit does all the heavy lifting. Yeah. It's just up to us to very graciously share it, not because we want them to know you're wrong and I'm right, we care so much. We want them to hear this and understand it. What they do with it, it's up to them. But we spend such little time actually sharing that, hoping that, well, I hope they know that I'm kind of a different, nice guy, and maybe they'll become a Christian because they think that I'm nice. Like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, at some point, we have to use words. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like we've, I think of apologetics, this idea, and I think of evangelism, and we, at least in America... I mean, it's beyond us, but definitely in America, in the Christian culture, we use the word, the words, I'm going to win somebody to Jesus. Yes. And, and I feel like that sets the tone for opposite of what we're describing here. Because right. it doesn't mean, it, it doesn't leave room for the Holy Spirit to do st what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Right. It's like, it's, it's an intellect, it means I intellectually overpowered them for Jesus, almost. Yeah. You put a notch in your belt, too. Like, right. yeah, you know, and here's... Another random thing, I shouldn't say random, I always feel the Holy Spirit you know, prompts me in different things, but this, this I think is pretty powerful. Here's a typical scenario that I see too often, and it's, it's the people involved are always very, very well intended, and it's often right. a, a, even a pastor. So let's say in a certain neighborhood, there's a family, and they're struggling in all the ways that family struggles with the marital stuff, you know, you know, health and the kids and finances and all that, and this is a family, they don't really go to church or anything, they're not atheists, but... And let's say the wife at one point thinks, man, life is, is rough. I just, I got to do something. This is crazy. I, I need to get back to church. You know, I went when I was in grade school, I just, boy, that's what I need to do. And so she just checks out some local church. And let's say it's actually decent, you know, church believes in the gospel. So she's at the church and people are welcoming her and she already feels better. It's like, oh, it's just encouraging environment. And, and then she sits through the service and it's about like anger management or how to raise your kids and some you know topical right. thing and it's you know good information but she's she's feeling good about that and then at the end after the anger management thing or how to raise your kids or help your neighbors the pastor says you know what if you're here today and you are struggling you just need to invite Jesus in your heart and she's thinking if anyone knows the solution to my problem a pastor would he just told me I need Jesus in my heart so she's like okay Come in my heart. She has no idea what that means. He didn't explain it. Now, most of the congregation knows the gospel right. message. Right. Knows He's referring to that. She doesn't know that. She's just thinking, apparently, Jesus wasn't in my heart. And now he is, because I said, come on in. 
So she's emotionally and, excited. And life's going to be rainbows and That's unicorns. Right. That's right. So afterwards, she's talking to people, and she's a visitor, so they're saying hi to her, and then she says, I did that thing. Like, you did what? The Jesus in my heart. Oh, we're so excited for you, and they get excited. Now she's excited that they're excited. She goes home. Life ain't any different. Yeah. And she'll hang in there for a while. One of two things happens. Either she's like, okay, well, that wasn't it. So she checks out meditation or yoga or whatever. Or... She keeps going to the church and go on, at least I'm saved now, and it's just struggling, and she becomes one of many others in that church that may not truly be saved because they don't really understand the gospel and all that. Um, so I think when we do share the gospel, we need to be a little bit more precise that this isn't just inviting Jesus in your heart because, you know, again, we know what people mean, but what we really mean is that we are sinners. We have separated ourselves yeah. from our Creator um, but he made a plan. He was going to send his own son to die on a cross to be the perfect uh, sacrifice for it because we can try to be better, but the, God's standard, especially when he's talking to the Jews in the Old Testament, just give us a list. Just give us a list. Yeah. No, you don't want a list. Give us yeah. a list. Here's Believe a list. Me, we can't do, do that. Want a list. <laughs> it's just like, that's my point. <laughs> my standard is 100% perfection. Stinks for us because we can't even get close to that. And God's saying, that's my point. You could never do it. That's why I yeah. sent my son to die on a cross. He paid your price. And another analogy I came up with, let's say, just think of one of the most rotten people you can imagine. They've done everything imaginable, just, you know, all these crimes, terrible. And now they're in prison for life with a, a bond set at, you know, $50 million. And they got like 25 bucks in their pocket. That's it. So they're, they're in prison for life. And a guy comes in and he's a multi-billionaire. And the prisoner knows like who this guy is. And the the multi-billionaire comes in and says, hey, I'm filthy rich. I can pay your bond to get you out of prison. The prisoner has one of three options to how he responds. First, he could say, I don't believe that. There's no way. You don't have that much money. You wouldn't, you know, whatever. Okay, if that's his response, he stays in prison for life. Second response is, I know you. You are filthy rich. You could be, you heartbeat, you could pay this. It'd be a piece of cake for you. That's all he does. He just believes it. He yeah. mentally believes it. This is true. That could happen. Right. He stays in prison for life. The third one is, I believe you could do that, and I'm accepting this gift from you. Puts out his hands and yeah. receives a gift. That's what Christianity is with the gospel. It's not just believing, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Satan believes that too. Right. Um, and even that, well, he died on the cross for my sins. Okay, you believe that that actually happened. What did you do about a person? Are you saying, I want this gift. I can't do it on my own. Thank you for yeah. forgiving my sins so I can spend eternity with you. That's what salvation is. It's a point in time, not just like... One other person that I was in a Bible study with in college, a great person, um, she was so excited about her faith. She was leading Bible studies and all that. And I just asked her for a testimony one day. I said, so when did you become a Christian? Well, I've, I've just always believed in Jesus. Mm -hmm. I was like, so when you were three months old, you believed in Jesus? Well, no, you know, not three months old. I said, six months, a year and a half? She goes, well, no. I just like, we kept talking. She realized... There was never a point in her life when she confessed her sins and asked for forgiveness to receive this gift, you know, the gospel message. She just saw, I thought, well, I guess I've just always believed in it. So I said, you know what? I don't want to question your upbringing too much, but you could settle it right now. Yeah. You could make sure that you understand. So later, if someone asks you, how do you know you're going to heaven? You could say, you know, if nothing else, on this particular day, I prayed and I said, God, thank you for this gift. I'm accepting, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, paid for my sins. Then you could say, you know, were you saved before that? Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't even matter now because you know at least at that point you clearly understood it and you can explain yeah. it. Because otherwise someone comes up to you and says, so, so how do I get to heaven? You just need to always have believed in Jesus your whole life. Yeah. How does that work for or, someone? Or do all the things that I've been doing. Yeah. This is what it so looks like. it's, yeah. it's just we need to maybe go the extra mile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that clarity piece is so important. And the, and the sad the sad truth is is I know this you you've experienced this too. Even just in sharing the story, I have experienced that so many times over and over again. Where people they don't have they don't have that moment of clarity. It's just sure. um, I'm a it's kind of this cultural Christian or the um, my parents were believers. You know, sure, it's, yeah. You know, the, the phrase we like to use and we've stolen it it wasn't it was originally with it originated with us but god doesn't have any grandchildren right only children right so that means you you have to have that specific yeah. relationship with and him. 
we should not only be able to convey that gospel message, but go a step further and explain why we believe it's true. Yes. You can easily show yeah. this is what the Bible says, but how do you know the Bible's <clears throat> true? And that's where you get into the apologetics, and I always say that God doesn't say, you know, if you get a chance, maybe kind of look into this a little bit. He commands us yeah. to have reasons for the hope that we have. And when you read the whole verse, reasons for the hope that we have in Christ, in our salvation, and that doesn't mean proving every single thing else. You know, it's just the hope we have is in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. Why do we have hope in the gospel message? Because we can trust God's revelation to us in general. Yes, there's general revelation in nature. That only takes you so far. You could study DNA and hummingbirds and all that, and you can come to the conclusion, this can't be an accident. It's so intricate. But you wouldn't know who created it, right. why they created it, what they want from you, what happens to you when you die. The only way you could know that is if God left you a note. Yeah. And the Bible is God's note. It makes that claim, and it gives us ways to test it. And so that's what we covered this weekend is you know, four areas, four major areas of testing. We focused on the one, the scientific one. Right. But there's so much evidence we should know at least a little bit of it. Yeah. And, and that, that reason for our hope, that is, um, you know, we're, it's a defense. So we're, that's that engagement with other people. But there, there is a value for us, too. Because it is it it is our starting point. It is our foundation, and I love I love the the meandering of our conversation. We started with this apologetics piece, um, scientific idea, all these things, but it ends at the gospel, and 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 ultimately it ends at the gospel and relationships, and um, and just that piece, and and the Holy Spirit has to be a part of that. I think that the difference that it makes is. We, we either are, um, my father-in-law used to say this all the time, we either are a sharp tool or we're a dull instrument. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, to, to know these things increases our foundation, gives us that confidence, but it also makes us a sharp tool. And, but a sharp tool still has to be used by the Holy Spirit. True. And so, so there's still humility and relationship and in, asking good questions. Those are all good things. And, um, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you sitting down with us. I have one last question for you. Sure. And um, as you engage with our body in between breaks and afterwards, and everybody's coming up with questions, is there is there a takeaway that you're like, okay, here's something that um, just to talk a little bit more on, just for a couple of minutes that maybe got missed in the talk, and it felt like our body had that need or that desire or just something even as you experience and interact with a lot of churches, is there a takeaway where it's like, man, this is the question that I really wish, really wish people would ask. Sure. It, a lot of it comes down, there's miscellaneous questions that come up, but they almost all come down to the fact is what does the Bible say? Cause sometimes Christians say, well, this is what I, my view, like the ice age or how this fits in or carbon 14 or the creation days or whatever. They'll have these ideas that, sound interesting on the surface, but I say, um, let's take a look at what Scripture is actually saying, because when you see that, you realize, oh, that's not a good answer. When I just say, you know, where did all the water go after the flood? That's just one of 50 million questions. Where did all the water go? A lot of Christian parents will say, well, I just believe God maybe miraculously evaporated and it just kind of disappears. Like, he could do that. What does Scripture say? Well, Psalm 104 says, at the end of the flood, God caused the mountains that did exist to rise even Higher. What does that teach us? They were lower before the flood. That's why Mount Everest, five and a half miles high, has sea creatures fossilized on it because it was lower initially, covered with flood waters, and catastrophically pushed up to five and a half miles high today. And then the oceans dropped down. Even secular geologists, you know, admit the oceans dropped down probably another mile. Well, you got mountains pushed up, oceans dropping down, the waters rushing off back into the back into the oceans today. And there's actually um, there's enough water on the earth. Not to go off on a tangent, but if you smooth the earth out, push the mountains down and raise the oceans up like a, so the earth is like a cue ball, there's enough water just in the oceans to cover the earth 1.7 miles deep. It's a that's lot amazing. of water. Yeah, That's just ocean water. Now, a few years ago, they discovered there's three times that much water in the layers of the earth. So when you look at what Scripture says, oh, that makes sense. The mountains are going up the, and the oceans' are, bottoms are dropping the water to be rushing off. That's what scripture says. That should be the foundation of our answer. What does scripture actually say? So that helps people know that that's their starting point rather than winging it and coming up with ideas that are not only scientifically inaccurate, they're not even biblically consistent. Yeah. So I try to train people first and foremost, 
See if there's anything in Scripture that would bring clarity. If so, go with that. If there's nothing, then you can check out some of these other interesting ideas. But we've gotten away from what does it actually say. And that's so important because our belief at the end of the day isn't on our philosophy or clever ideas. It's in God's Word, and that's where the power is. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Thanks for your time with us. Thanks for coming to our church. Uh, Thanks for doing what you do. And just, we'll put this out there one last time, the starting point project, Project. project.com. Yep. Lots of great resources. Lots of good stuff. Grand Canyon tours and all that. Lots of fun stuff. Jay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's my honor to be here. Thank you.